It's really great to have Josh Thiessen back here again with me today. And uh, one of the reasons I'm glad he's going to be here today is that he's showing us another series in his um, his beautiful work. But I also wanted to say that some people mentioned they were a little nervous about watching the previous episode with Josh because they felt like they didn't know enough about art. But I, one of the reasons that I like to bring artists on and talk about art is that I think the whole process of art making can teach us something about the way the cosmos is put together. And uh, at the same time as that kind of world building happens in the process of making a piece of art, I think it can also teach us something about building our own world view. And so I think those are all really important parts of looking at the process. And so Josh is gonna show us his series. And while he's showing us the series, I might occasionally bring up things about archetypes or about um, scientific processes if, if it comes to mind because these things all line up actually in a certain space. and. And it all relates to reality and just the structure of reality. So um, this is a, a great series and I hope we all enjoy it together. So Josh, I've set you up so that you can share a screen <clears throat> and feel free to get started. Oh, wonderful. And I just wanna echo what you said that, uh, you know, although art can seem in intimidating and, and only for an elite group of people, for me, I really uh, believe that art should be democratic for all people. And I think it could be engaged in on all levels. So from, you know, a formal aesthetic viewpoint uh, to more of a philosophical worldview building uh, perspective. But I, I think with, with my art, with the collectors who purchased it, um, it, it's been people who are just, you know, commoners to academics and everywhere in between. And so I, I really like to kind of dispel some of those myths about art being only for uh, a select few. Yeah, well, I like to remember back to one of Jordan Peterson's um, speeches that he made early on where he was talking about the importance of art and how every person should try to have at least one piece of original art because part of the process of deciding what to buy is to understand your own aesthetic and to understand your own sense of taste. Yes. And, uh, to not Definitely. be fearful of developing your own sense of taste. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, further study in art history or just going to art museums and galleries is a great place to begin. Um, you don't necessarily need to be told what to like, um, but at least to have an appreciation or a curiosity for, for learning something you didn't know or, or checking mm -hmm. out a style of work that, that you don't know uh, so much about you never know you might actually um, like it a lot more than you think yeah yeah okay so let's Wait, get started okay. I will share my screen here okay so going to talk more about my latest painting series Phanatos and Viriditas and this is one that I've been working on for the past three years so about 5,000 hours I calculated and uh, 23 works in total. I, I won't be able to get to all of those pieces uh, in, in our time together, but I want to show some highlights. It culminated in a solo exhibition which just took place at Ray's Contemporary Gallery in New York City and it was up for a month. And uh, these are a few pictures from the opening reception. And uh, it, it was a, a real highlight because if, if anyone knows anything about art, New York City is, you know, a real art capital. And so uh, I was very thrilled that this gallery that had been has been established for over 80 years would take on a, a younger artist like myself. Um, they have a real commitment to quality and excellence, artists who uh, use like old masters techniques. So it was um, really the right place uh, to to show show my work. So um, I wanted to just uh, show a couple images there. So okay. just for the people who didn't see episode one, could you remind us again how old you are, Josh? I am I'm 27. And okay. <laughs> uh, so, so in, in art world standards, that's still emerging. You don't really... <laughs> Yeah, you get past emerging until your 40s or 50s because artists can have longer careers. Um, so it's it's I'm the the youngest artist that the gallery has represented by I think 
quite a few years. So it's it's uh, 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 definitely something something special. But I've been at this for over I think fifteen, at least over ten years um, professionally full time. So um, I, I I've been at it at it a while, relatively speaking. <laughs> Okay, great. So auguries of innocence. So yes. what, um, this was the first one in the series. Yeah. So I first began uh, reading actually a, a portion of William Blake's poem auguries of innocence and this this real enchantment with the natural world. Uh, there, there's a line in uh, the the poem to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower holds infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Kill not the moth nor butterfly for the last judgment draweth nigh. And so I was quite interested in that last couplet um, with, with butterflies and, and moths. And so you'll see there's an, another painting as well of a, a moth. And uh, I did this mini series and uh, essentially, um, one of the kind of foundational motifs in this series is the, the the Japanese Zen gardens, which often have this black sand that you can see uh, that the the butterfly has uh, alighted upon, and really in the, in the Japanese aesthetic worldview, these rock gardens are are meant to represent the temporality of life and that that it's it's fleeting I, I myself even tried um, making my own a rock garden and breaking the patterns to to create uh, these paintings and I can attest how how challenging it is um, because the the wind does blow the the sand very quickly um, but that was a motif that occurs throughout the painting series and represents my character Colette which I will uh, uh, speak a little bit now uh, about uh, further along as we get along and this kind of uh, nihilism and usually like the the black or the white is very you know, monochromatic and not colorful and then that's contrasted with um, the butterfly and the moth which are representative of my other character Sophia which is all about seeing the the beauty of life and and the wonder and and joy and so I was very interested in this duality early on of, of you know death and life of enigma and you know embodied wisdom and uh, this this wise blueprint that that Sophia represents and also I I wanted to because a lot of my paintings have a conservation message um, butterflies and especially moss they kind of have a PR problem people think of moss as being these kind of nasty creatures that get into our closets um, but uh, they like butterflies are pollinators and so they're essential insects are essential for our survival how they pollinate plants which then in turn uh, give us uh, oxygen air to breathe um, and so uh, I wanted to um, pick up on the innocence of, of animals and creatures and on the preservation of uh, the, the innocence. And so that was also represented in um, the, the crucifix here, this Celtic cross symbol, which uh, represents uh, suffering uh, of Christ and how uh, these innocent creatures uh, often suffer and sometimes are, are used as just uh, uh, to be found in cabinets of curiosities, butterfly collectors. But I wanted to paint uh, real living uh, creatures in in uh, these paintings. So could we go back to the previous one for just a second yes. um, to see the world in a grain of sand? So as you contemplated that, did you um, think about all the different imagery related to sand? It's it, yeah, there, there's so many ways. I, I'm curious what what are what what comes to mind for for you? Well, one of my very favorite verses of the Bible, which I've mentioned many times on this um, program, is uh, Jeremiah 5.22, for he has made the sand a boundary for the sea, and okay. no matter how the waves may crash and roll, they cannot cross over it. Hmm. And okay. uh, that was a verse that God gave me when I was going through a particularly tumultuous time in my life, okay. and um, it was such a, a comfort to me to know that 
he wouldn't allow anything to come in and destroy my life. It hadn't interesting. It yeah. hadn't first been filtered through his fingers um, to make sure that that there was a, there was a meaning and a purpose there, and that I could uh, trust the boundaries that he placed in my life, both the ones keeping the bad out and keeping me from crossing over boundaries that I shouldn't cross over and all those things. And ever since that verse was so important to me, I, whenever I'm on the beach, I, I'm always looking at the sand and contemplating, how is it that something so passive and uh, still can be an effective boundary against something as powerful as the sea? Hmm. and then also thinking Maybe. about to see the world in a grain of sand how a grain of sand has heaven only knows how many quantum particles in it yeah um there's there's so much more there than just looking at that single grain of sand and then here you've collected all these grains of sand and what you've illustrated here is that when you look at grains of sand through a microscope each one is unique. It's not like they're all little oh, cubes or something, right? Every one of them has character. And and you've shown that so beautifully here. Oh, I love I love that. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that brings to mind the, the fact that, you know, God, the creator knows the number of the sands uh, on on the shore of the, on the whole earth and uh, the number of grains of sand. And they, they are, you know, unique. Um, even like he counts the hairs on her head <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, there there's something that you know when when painting uh, sand you really can't do it uh, in in a, a uniform way and if you do it, it looks um, like computer generated or uh, too too repetitive there needs to be variation and so mm -hmm. I, I really noticed that just on a, a practical standpoint of um you know increasing the variety of the the actual size of the grains of sand and how they uh, naturally would would fall along even what is a, a pattern raked over the the sand uh, you even see some larger pebbles interspersed there which I thought would add to um, more of the the natural scene because I I, I wanted it to look like a uh, a sandy beach shore, like the, the black sand beaches of Iceland, for instance. One of the other things I wanted to point out is that when you're painting like a butterfly um, or looking at butterflies or moths, yeah. um, if, you if a butterfly was just completely blue, all blue, it wouldn't be nearly as beautiful as it is because the, the dark lines cause the blue to have more of a blueness about it and so yeah, that, that like it's like the dark places and... yeah the dark places in our life actually allow the beauty to shine through in a way that it wouldn't otherwise so that's, go that's on to right. the next one and we can see yeah. the dark spots on the moth yeah yes yeah so that this is a blue morpho butterfly and uh this is a madagascan moon moth and uh, it's hard to get a perspective of how large these moths are, but if you look at the palm of your hand, they're even larger than that. From I, I was attacked yeah. by a moth that was larger than the palm of my hand when oh. I was in Haiti as a missionary. Wow. At one point. So, <laughs> okay, where... <laughs> so, so you, yeah, you know the the sizes of it can of be those. pretty scary. <laughs> Amazing, I know it's it's true. Their their markings are so beautiful and. Uh, uh, it's fascinating that they they have these short lifespans. Like, uh, I believe the moon moth is only a few days, six to eight days, something like that. Oh, um, really? Wow. And so they're they're here one day and gone the next, and this this fleeting kind of glimpse of beauty. But but you're right when you see these markings, and you see both like the aesthetic wonder, but then there's also a utility. So those those markings that look like eyes. Uh, those four eyes on the back of the the wings actually serve as a survival mechanism so that predators will will see them as you know competitors uh, in in the forest and so I think that's also um, very fascinating yeah yeah it's beautiful yeah can I yes move let's on to the next move one on, yeah. okay so this one's uh refracting infinity and this was the first painting that I incorporated this character 
of Kolat. And um, Kolat is Hebrew for teacher, which uh, we read about in the Jewish wisdom literature, the Hebrew Bible, or as Christians known as the Old Testament. And the book of Ecclesiastes um, talks about how there's this, this teacher and he's trying to find the, the meaning of life, uh, vanity of vanity, all is vanity is uh, the, the common refrain. And so in, in this painting, I, I was really wanting to show how he is uh, disconnected from, from nature. On the one hand, this is like a university science lab that he's peering into this, this window. And uh, I came across this quote by Blaise Pascal, who is a, a mathematician. On all sides, I behold nothing but infinity in which I am a mere atom, a mere passing shadow that returns no more. And so this uh, quote informed the title for the, the painting. But then I, I was, you know, wrestling with this idea of smoke and mirrors and how infinitesimally small we are in the vastness of, of the universe, um, but how there's, there's wonder. So the, the strings in the window are representative of string theory, which is this idea that at the subatomic level that there's vibrating strings of energy connecting um, everything to, together. And then even with the, 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 the sunflower, um, there's what's called the, the golden ratio, which you might be familiar mm -hmm. with, and, and the Fibonacci sequence where in all uh, biological growth, uh, there's, there's this spiral pattern shape that um, in, informs that from the Nautilus shell or the, the magnitude of, of galaxies all follow this uh, golden ratio. And so uh, I was interested in this tension between disenchantment of the, the natural world that Colette wrestles with, you know, or do we just live in a universe of blind, pitiless indifference as, as Richard Dawkins famously articulated, or do we see signs of an intelligent designer uh, when we look into nature and when you see these, you know, beautiful indigo bunting birds. So I'm curious, when you were in New York at the gallery with your show and you had all these people coming by and looking at the work, were you able to talk about things like that with them? So I would the, think the, that most people in the New York art scene are probably not very open to that idea. <laughs> um, so all of the artist statements for the individual paintings were hung on the wall beside the painting. So I, I was quite uh, you know, pleased by that because in the past, some galleries have been wary of incorporating any of my text to go alongside the, the paintings because they said, oh, well, they're didactic and we just let the viewer interpret the work. Mm -hmm. There, There's kind of a, a postmodern sentiment, the death of the author view where uh, the, the viewer's interpretation is just as valid or more valid than the artist's interpretation. But I, I have been surprised that the galleries I've worked with recently have found that um, the, the the artist statements I write aren't dogmatic. They, I mean, to, to what extent, because um, sometimes commercial gallery owners, they're, they're not necessarily like the the philosophical type they're more concerned about sales and and that's all very important um but but i uh, tend to find that people in new york are very curious um like i was giving an interview or i was giving a tour to the fine art connoisseur editor and i was just amazed how inquisitive he was how he engaged with the concepts and ideas and he said in the last five years and especially since the pandemic it's really pushed the uh art world to consider some of these deeper themes and and kind of a search and quest for for meaning um even within the the art market and the new york art world so i i was very encouraged to hear that because um you don't necessarily think like this is the place to to ponder uh whether it be religion or philosophy well, it may, it should be because yes. I mean the artist the been. artist throughout all the centuries has been kind of at the forefront of movements. I mean, certainly we saw the 
the abstracting and the cubism and everything that took place at the beginning of the 20th century as being very um, predictive of what was to come afterwards. So, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so, it, so in this Colette guy, what, what, what's in the reflection of his glasses? Okay. So he, he, in his glasses, that's what is, he's actually uh, reflecting the window itself. So uh, ah. I'll go to a closer image here. If you look really closely, you can uh -huh. see the, the window, yes. that gothic um, uh -huh. art shaped window and even his own reflection. And so I thought that was kind of meta where uh -huh. <laughs> he's reflecting himself. Uh, and and the, the, they're kind of like these steampunk glasses, which uh -huh. look like scientist spectacles. And so I was very curious. I was very interested in creating this um, austere, mysterious, uh, shadowy figure that people would be um, interested in, kind of, or curious to to figure out his identity. And the the bluebird is holding one of the strings. That's fascinating. <laughs> yes, yeah, you can you know, interpret it as these two buntings making a nest, um, or reflecting like for this this larger theme of the interconnectedness of, of nature and its design um, with string theory. Uh, so I was curious to hopefully provoke some some questions, questioning. Yeah, so I've recently been reading some stuff on projective geometry. Um, okay. I don't know if you're familiar with Rudolf Steiner and the people yeah. that were in his orbit one of the mathematicians that was very interested in Steiner's work was a guy by the name of George Adams Kaufman, who later okay. called himself just George Adams. And he wrote a number of works on projective geometry as being um, kind of at the foundation of everything in there. It, it's really fascinating. So when I first saw the strings here, I thought, oh, this is like projective geometry. Oh, but, interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. So, yes. so let's move on to the next okay. one. I mean, yes. I, I'm, I'm holding you up on some of this. That's, no, that's okay. I, I wanted to just show this is uh, it, uh, inspired by Van Gogh's sunflower painting. You can see uh, the sunflower, my painting. I, I try to, uh, you know, develop a dialogue because Van Gogh also saw wonder and the divine through nature. Um, and uh, even these uh, dying wilted sunflowers. Okay, so here's, we, we touched on this painting briefly at the end, Swallowed by Knowledge. Um, but not nearly enough. If you, oh. I, I, there are a few things I, I didn't mention, um, but if you had any specific questions uh, uh, to, to. Well, let's go further, over again, why, why it's taking place inside the, the belly of the whale. Yes, so. This was um, a motif from Jonah and the Whale, which in, in a sense can represent uh, like going into the, the depths and like whether that be an existential crisis or um, trying to find a meaning and purpose in, in life. And so uh, although that was, of course, in, in, the, in the ocean, um, this is above ground in this uh, uh, uh rib cage of a whale and this is actually specifically a rib cage of sperm whale which is one of the largest um whales in in the world and i think it's interesting how they have these massive massive brains and they're they're very intelligent creatures but you know just like us dust to dust ashes to ashes um are all that remains is this this rib cage and so the, the painting itself was um, a, a pondering on our mortality and the limits of, of knowledge. And I was curious, like Kierkegaard has been an, an interest of, of mine. And, and in his day, there was this debate going back and forth. He was very opposed to uh, Hegel, whose view was that we could find this, uh, you know, rational, interpretation of life, this unifying theory, uh, purely just through human ingenuity and, and knowledge, whereas Kierkegaard was talking about how has, as humans, we have limitations, we're finite beings, and ultimately, we need to, to take a leap of faith um, with fear and trembling. And so 
that was something I was pondering because I, I love the study of, of, of books and various academic disciplines, um, but no, no human could possibly know every piece of information um, in their lifetime. And so uh, we, we have to rely, in, in my view, on an omniscient creator who can give us divine wisdom to be able to um, sift through all of this, this knowledge and information um, to find what's worth reading and, and what, what isn't necessarily. So the, the book that Koloth is holding, is that a particular book? Uh, so, yeah, so this is um, part of the book of Ecclesiastes. And in the final chapter, it says of making many books, there is no end and much study wearies the body. And so it, it seems a little bit nihilistic. I mean, coming from the, the Bible, uh, but it's it's a very sobering truth that uh, he's he's come to terms with. Um, and then there's there's the the little elf owl on on his cap, which I thought was kind of a, a little bit of humor because owls are symbolically representative of of wisdom or knowledge. And, and how we can get so lost in our pursuits of knowledge of reading that uh, we don't even notice there's uh, an owl sitting on our, our head. <laughs> I also notice in the forefront of the painting, there's a, a timepiece. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, bottom left. Uh-huh. Well, I got behind here. Yeah, bottom left there. Um, and that that's... Uh, uh, actually a pocket watch that I inherited from my great uncle Percy and I've incorporated it in a, a couple of my my paintings um, but I, I thought it would be an, an interesting element to kind of also represent the the passing of of time. So one of the things I want to point out to the people who are looking at this is how many things a, an artist contemplates either consciously or unconsciously when doing a work like this. And so I'm looking at all the rib bones here and you have this division of space that is non-identical all the way across. A very interesting division of space. So you know, a, a person who's not an artist might be tempted to paint all the ribs equidistant from each other, mm. have them all lined up like prison bars or something. Mm. But here you can see that there's a variation in the distances between the ribs. There's also this sense of uh, circular motion throughout the whole thing. So the ribs yes. are creating this motion, but then you have the motion in the black sand at the bottom going around in this circular thing. And the, the mountains are high on one side and low on the other. So that adds to this sense of this circular thing. And, and it's all bringing you into that page in Ecclesiastes there. But that's not the only white thing in the in the image. We also have little sparkles of white in the watch, in the lamp, mm -hmm. in some of the other books and some of the highlights on the rib bones that carries the eye around. So you don't get stuck any place, but you can still come back and contemplate the main part of the image here. Mm -hmm. And so those are the kinds of things that an artist might not be consciously thinking of, and yet it's it shows up in the work. And that's what I always mean when I say that the elements and principles of design yes, exactly. show up even when you're not, not consciously trying to think about it. Because if you consciously try to think about it, you get so stuck, you can't move forward. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, it, exactly. Um, yeah, that's very observant to, to notice um, the pattern of the sand, which... Uh, the, the circle is right below that uh, floating lantern orb, which I, I designed. And so I, I wanted to draw the eye to that. Um, it's not quite the central, it's not the central focal point necessarily of the painting compositionally. It's not right in the, the middle, but um, I think conceptually it, it holds a lot of weight because it's what illuminates the whole rib cage and, and all the books and even the book that, that he's reading. Well, it's also completely different than anything else in the painting. So, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, and and that's where, um, you know, even some of the books are are floating, 
uh, upwards. It's like they're kind of being drawn toward the light. And I, I like this idea. Initially, I thought of painting a lantern that was uh, affixed to the spinal cord of the uh, rib cage at the top there. But then I thought it would be interesting if it were just uh, floating because uh, you think uh, it's it's not this is not just something that's supposed to be interpreted literally necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's this floating orb, this this presence in the painting. It's it's just incredible. It's beautiful. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Okay, so what do we have next? Hey, this is uh, Memento Mori, and this painting. Although it was painted um, near the end of the series, I, I wanted to show it earlier right now because uh, in in the the Dutch still life painting tradition of the 17th century, um, there was um, it was this motif called memento mori paintings, which is Latin for remember that you will die. And it will often in these paintings, the artists and their still lifes would incorporate skulls and ephemera, uh, moths, um, things that were, were dying to uh, remember, uh, to remind viewers of their mortality. And so uh, I was also very interested in how usually depictions of St. Francis of Assisi are in caves. And he also has a, a skull, which in, in our modern era, we think of skulls as being just sort of these macabre things associated with Halloween and, and goth, but in the medieval ages and also further into the 17th century um, Dutch still life, golden age, they were important reminders um, to really reflect on, on what is meaningful in life and how Colette, he's experiencing in this moment uh, a decentering of of his ego in order to find his true self and i think that's what uh looking at death square in the face does um and like in, in a Jungian perspective making space for communion with god when our ego is pushed uh, aside and so um that was and then also the the candles itself uh uh, melting um, are, are also a kind of a memento mori motif. Um, so there, yeah, there is a lot kind of going on in this painting um, that the fate, our fate as humans is the same as that of the animals, like the, the lemurs. Um, we all end up in, in the grave. And so uh, I think it's an important message in an age where like in Kierkegaard's words, we're living in the the, the reflector age where we're always trying to distract ourselves where we live in this death averse culture and so this was a painting that I think uh, pushed back against that sentiment and I'd, I'd also like to point out for people that here your your color motif is the complementary colors of lavender and and yellow or gold Yes. Um, <clears throat> with just these little touches of red because that identifies cola. But yeah. Um, and again, those little touches of red are throughout, not just on him. There's one in the water down below. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a hint of red in the sky above. Um, but there's a dot that the lavender is definitely dominant here. So it takes up yes. 80, 90 percent of the frame. And I've tried to point out in the past that the whole issue of dominance is that we tend to think of dominance in sense of nowadays of the patriarchy dominating the hierarchy. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and we think of nom dominance in a bad way, but in, in art, dominance actually functions as the, the frame in which the focal point can shine. And so here That's you have right. a perfect example of that because you have this big dominant lavender uh, subtle background with these vibrant golden light in the center there. Yes. Um, yes. That, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful comment and observation because I, I was interested in how these intersecting quartz crystal columns in the background reminded me of cathedral stained glass windows and how these are places that people often contemplate death and mortality. 
Um, but on on like an aesthetic standpoint, this painting is very cool. It's almost achromatic. Um, it's not not black and white, but um, with the the Colette paintings, the these Vanitas paintings, you'll you'll notice that um, they're they're very cool, and th there is the the contrast. You're right with the, the those those red tones on his costume and even the the candles. I think uh, I had a close up uh, image here. And and I think that draws the eye into the the central focal point of, mm -hmm. of the painting because it is quite a a busy composition, probably busier than I, I usually would paint, but um with the use of a very limited color palette for the whole background, um that that busyness doesn't compete, it, I, I hope, for the the central subject matter, uh, the, the dominance of of Colette holding the skull and even the 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 table and the lemurs um, mm -hmm. accompanying him. Yeah, just it's amazing. <laughs> okay, so okay. Oh, this was the an example of of one of the still life paintings by Van Utrecht from 1642, and you can see the the similarity uh, with with the the skull that I employed. Mm -hmm there okay there's the the next painting um creation cathedral and this painting was inspired by an iconic work by emily carr who's a canadian impressionist painter she has this uh famous work of uh a church in U indian church in yuko village and it's uh, on vancouver island and so in this painting, I was really musing on how there's this church that the First Nations Indigenous people had built. And uh, I was reading a book by Robin Wall Kimmerer, Braiding Sweetgrass, and it was about um, you know, wisdom from the Indigenous tradition and what we can learn from it for uh, ecological care and, and how um, in in the indigenous worldview, animals are seen as the the elder brothers and sisters of creation that we can learn from, and how that resonates with even my own uh, Christian worldview. There's passage in the Book of Job, uh, which talks about, "But ask the animals, and they will teach you. Who among all these does not know that um, the life?" of every creature is in God's hands. And this awareness of uh, creation's praise, you can see the, the stained glass windows. Um, I, usually in stained glass windows, you'd see uh, people, saints from the past. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because often uh, animals can also be seen as these creaturely saints. Um, in the, the top one, there's the, the dove hovering over uh, the the earth as a, a symbol of of peace the the Holy Spirit and I was thinking about how you know Colette and Brother Wolf is uh, accompanying him on this journey and so he's he's pondering the scene. There's also the the gravestone markers which um, are representative of the two hundred unmarked graves of. Indigenous children that were discovered uh, at the same time of the the pandemic, and there's been a real reckoning in our country, um, a call for truth and reconciliation because the residential schools um, basically uh, took children from their parents, and this was operated by the church and funded by the the government, and so we have a very challenging um, situation in our country, and I assume. Uh, there are similar stories in, in the U.S. about residential schools, and so this this painting um, was was my kind of uh, 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 wrestling or pondering uh, those those events at the time. Beautiful use of color harmony, yeah, it's it's really lovely, Thank and I, I'm I'm fascinated because the white wolf there we have a we have a white Alaskan husky. Who just happens to look exactly like a white wolf, but she's not yes. as big as a wolf, and so 
<laughs> yeah, that's yeah. no, that that's interesting because um, I have another painting, Brother Wolf, which is the same wolf in a, a minaret tower. And uh, the collectors who purchased it said that it reminded them of their their dog. So mm -hmm. uh, 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 a husky. And so, yeah, I can see um, yeah the, the similarities for sure. And uh, yeah, the the color palette, I I really uh, like. You, you're mentioning, um, I I love um, British Columbia's old growth forests. You have these cedars and Douglas fir trees, and you know Emily Carr spoke of these places as 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 cathedrals in a sense. Um, God in His woods, tabernacle were her specific words, and. Um, I, I think there's this kind of transcendent experience when we're among these, you know, giant sequoia trees, for for instance, in, in California, um, that I, I think there's a lot of transcendence um, within these places and uh, just the, the growth and the new life um, that are represented there. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Oh, let's see what I have next. Okay, this is the next painting called uh, Nirvana 5G. And very uh, timely is... since uh, <laughs> Apple put out their I know, glasses yeah. the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was reading that. Yeah, those new glasses. Um, which is kind of interesting because I was I was reading that that they're saying that a lot of these virtual reality headsets, like the previous ones, haven't um, caught on like they thought because uh, if people don't really like strapping this computer to their head and kind of disconnecting from um, the world. But then apparently these new Apple VR headsets, you can see through the glasses and people can see your eyes through them. So they're they're trying to make some some compromise. <laughs> But uh, who knows? Uh, we'll we'll see if they they catch on. <laughs> um, One of the things I've noticed recently about vision, and I I don't know if it's just happening to me recently or if it's something that's always happened, but I never noticed it. And it happened. I mean, I noticed it the first time last week. There was some sort of an ad online for. Well, I won't say what it was for. It looked to me when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, there's a water scene, and mm -hmm. then. Just moments later, it sort of snapped into place and there was a shoe sitting in front of this light green background. The shoe was also light green and the background was light green. And it's like, wait a minute, was that shoe there before? It was there, but I just didn't see it. Hmm. And, and so like on here, I looked at this painting and he's in this rocky environment. And then all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, what is that? Oh, <laughs> look at those eyes. Yeah, yeah, see, you don't see the. I didn't see him there uh, at all until I saw his eyes. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, you know, when I painted it, I, I didn't really think about that. I knew he, I wanted this this black jaguar to be kind of camouflaged, and he, he his, his black fur blends into the rubble, but then the the piercing eyes reflect the, the orange and yellow of the fire. Yeah, and, yeah, it's brilliant. And so, That's brilliant kind of giving this glare and um <laughs> there, well, I, I often talk about how part of what happens in art is that the artist is sort of picking the order out of the chaos that, and that's yeah. what they're painting they're painting the order that's yeah. hiding oh, in okay. the chaos right that's, yeah. and so this is a visual illustration of that yes de definitely yeah finding order and chaos because even like this um 5g cell tower that is directly above Colette's head was in in a way like this modern tree of knowledge but because I placed it in the center of the composition um all of a sudden it's it's above his head and he's levitating kind of like the Buddha under the the tree of enlightenment uh I there there's even a, a little bit of a joke here on the uh the satellite uh it's it's called Bodhi uh, <laughs> for those who notice it, but um, back and to vultures up there. I love yeah the vultures. yeah. Oh and my gosh! The... <laughs> <laughs> there yeah, there's these seven vultures because yeah, the, you know, are they perching on a tree? This is like a, 
this very strange artificial um tree there's there's surveillance and uh it, it's it's there's even like this all-seeing eye which i turned into from the like the wi-fi emblem at the bottom of um i guess the the trunk of the tree if you want to call it that uh, and so i think that's where you're you're right that the composition brings order out of chaos and that's what art hopefully does uh when it when it, at its best is is finding meeting in the in the chaos and hopefully shining a, a spotlight on some of these modern and relevant issues of escapism and just uh leaving this world to uh, entertain ourselves to oblivion yeah mm -hmm. Could you go back and show the whole thing again? Sure. Yeah, so I want people to notice why it is that it looks like he's levitating. And that is because it's not anchored with a shadow. That's right. Right? So there, these are the little tricks that an artist can play. <laughs> yeah, so yes. Yeah, so and there's a, a difference of, of value. So that's a artistic term value uh, essentially connotes the lightness or darkness of of a color so mm -hmm. uh, objects closer to us according to atmospheric perspective will appear richer and darker in color so you can see his his bright red and black coat are uh, much stronger in color than the black jaguar which is, is also black but um i i put you know, a, a fair amount of, of mist, there's kind of this rising smoke. Um, and like with, with the rubble, one of the compositional challenges was how how to separate it from these uh, crumbling skyscrapers in the background. And, you know, I was trying to pick up on these motifs of apocalyptic films and video games. And I, I realized that if I... Um, really push the, the atmosphere you can see how the skyscrapers way in the distance are, are so faded they're almost um that buff pale yellow and then there's uh the, that bluish gray or purplish gray smoke that uh, separates the the pile of rubble that the cell tower is affixed to to uh, the, the background that hopefully uh, you see that separation so visually you can take in the the composition even though there's a lot going on here yeah and one of the other things that i want to call attention to is this whole issue of dominance again and in this case the dominance is a matter of contrast yeah so everything about him is very sharp contrast in the front and that's why the saturation of the colors is so brilliant and then everything behind him is a much much subtler contrast like when you dial down the contrast on your tv or if you dial down the contrast yes. photograph that's exactly what you get and so this is why he's really starkly in the foreground very obviously and then everything else sort of disappears behind him just enough so that he's very very noticeable and yeah. again the 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 low contrast is the dominance of the frame and the high contrast is the is the minority but that's where the that's where the eye goes and so i just want yes. to point that out exactly yeah yeah great thanks for pointing and then that you out. have that little trinity of gold the, the two eyes and then the big fire and the small fire and that keeps everybody's eye rotating right around him yes exactly yeah yeah good 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 point and i i thought um there needed to be a, a balance you see the um dumpster fire uh whatever you want to call it, on the, the the in the foreground on the right or kind of middle ground that uh is is larger than the one on the left um like that balances out that you you have weight in a composition that mm -hmm. you, you need to balance out and so you have the jaguar on the left and you also have even that that car in the background and the fire there and so that that Seemed in my mind to balance out the the larger uh fire on the right hand side um and uh and then like the trinity the three elements uh with then colette right in the foreground with his bright fiery red i i think um it, it does balance the the eyes perception of the painting so it doesn't seem lopsided so uh, i i thanks for 
for noticing that. Well, it, it's also a great attention getter because mm. there, there's a tendency of a viewer, if there are things that are falling off the edge of the painting, the viewer's eye can go right off yes. the, edge of the painting onto somebody else's painting. Yes. <laughs> but but here that that dumpster fire is like grips you. It keeps you in the frame. So you keep coming back and looking at what's what's centered there. So yes. Yeah. And it it adds um a little bit of interest and variety so that, that the background isn't so disjointed from Colette and his bright red um epaulets and cuffs. Mm -hmm. I I think it tied into the, the background of the composition. Um, with adding that little bit of fire in, in the background um, as, as well. Yeah, that's great. Well, okay. So there's the, the closing. Okay. Uh, my next painting, this mm -hmm. is All Creatures Lament. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh. Th this was a, a sobering painting. And sometimes I show the beauty of the natural world, but other times um, I create paintings that are more of a, a lament um, to show and reflect the ecological crisis and natural disasters. Uh, this this painting uh, reflects the BP oil spill of Deepwater Horizon back in 2010, um, but also the issue of uh, plastics in the ocean. You can see this mother pelican is caught in a uh, fishing net and also a uh, fishing line as, as well. Well, it's such a, also just a beautiful illustration of that, that old um, <clears throat> tale, story, myth of the pelican. Yes. That, that she feeds her young out of her, out of her heart. That's right. Oh, I'm 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 glad you you know that because not yeah. not everyone is familiar with that that story because that uh really um was the inspiration for this painting for the the composition this story that originated from second century monastic texts of the the legend of when there are seasons of drought the the mother pelican would uh, sacrifice herself for her young um by puncturing her her breast and they would feed fr from her and so it, it became this this symbol of self-sacrifice and was applied to to christ and in mm -hmm. church stained glass windows you often uh will will discover this mother pelican and her young um and you'll see and you'll notice in the painting that there's uh the, the sun that's directly uh, behind the the mother pelican's head and that kind of served as as a halo and how i i was thinking uh about how you know look how we can look into the face of these innocent suffering creatures we also look into the face of of christ and how he suffered on behalf of and stood up for the oppressed um and and how we can also stand up for even oppressed animal species like uh, these pelicans that were affected and uh you know there's still these these natural disasters like the ohio train derailment um several weeks ago and how you know forty five thousand animals were killed um often mostly birds and, and fish as a result of these natural disasters yeah it's, it's just horrendous um so this is a, a beautiful representation of all those things. But I also want to point out one technical thing for people, because I think it's also deeply symbolic. Mm -hmm. And that is when you're looking at this painting, you can't help but see how the sunlight is just streaming out of that orb behind the pelican's head. There's such a vivid light coming there. And how on earth does an artist achieve that? And part of it is that you get that, that luminous quality by if you notice the the perimeter right outside the sun, the first third or so of the perimeter is very desaturated. The rest of the sky is more of a saturated, bright, brilliant uh, teal and, and soft green. But right around the orb is this very desaturated soft gray. And it's the 
the contrast between that soft neutral gray and then the, the gold and then yes. the white that actually makes the sun just come right off the page. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's just so representative too of the way the world is. Um, I notice on days when it's cloudy that the trees are greener and the flowers are more brilliant. You'd think it would be the other way around, yeah. but when it's sunny out, sometimes things get bleached out. Yes. But but yeah. when it's a gray day, you see the beauty so much more. And so we're always wishing for everything to be happy and jolly all the time. But I just don't think the beauty of life shows up all the time when everything is yeah. happy and jolly. That that's right. Yes. And you know, as an artist who primarily paints animals, um, it can be tempting to just paint them in their idyllic landscapes and natural habitats but I think to to contrast that the beauty of that with also the the darker side of of life um I think is it important um to to show and that it, it, in, a, in a strange way that there can be beauty still seen like even with it, this struggling mother pelican um the American white pelican during mating season their their beak and their their eyes actually um, become more vibrant and saturated and so you see actually as I zoom in there's um, you, you see the the iris mm -hmm. the pupil you see that that bright turquoise yeah. color that I thought was still you know nevertheless striking and, and beautiful amidst a scene that is is a little bit di disturbing um and that even this this smoky, uh, smoggy sky, uh, being quite eerie, also has a, a beauty to it, um, as as well, in in the face of something uh, a traumatic um, event. Yeah, I, I really like the way you made the sky the same color as the eye. Yes, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, that usually the the color uh, of the composition is dictated by the central subject. So all the color of the background is reflected in the color of the, the pelicans. Um, so you can see how like the, the orange uh, beak is represented in that, the, the fire explosion of the, the oil rig and also the uh, large cargo ships in the background. So, and mm -hmm. uh, obviously like the, the, the turquoise eye too. Yeah. Yeah, the yellow. Okay. Oh, and this was a, a shot of me painting it in my studio so you can get a, a context. Okay. okay. Uh, this painting oh my. titled The Ferret Trials. And um, it, it's it's also a little bit of a lament, but for uh, a, another controversial issue, which is uh, animal testing and, and vivisection. And I had been, you know, doing research and, and found that that ferrets are often used in animal experiments um, for vaccines and otherwise, and uh, sadly uh, succumb to to that. And how uh, this this painting, you have this this lone ferret laying on this this science lab table, and you have these seven rose petals, which. Uh, are kind of like a funeral or a, a eulogy for the life of of this ferret who has uh, uh, suffered at the hands of oftentimes scientific experiments, uh, gain of function that is kind of like a mad scientist experiment without any ethical concerns for for life. And so, um, this was uh, a foray in a, in a new area that I haven't really explored and might explore more so in the future, but uh, it's incredible how still all around the world in um, both the West and, and the East that, that animal experimentation goes on um, and, and most people uh, don't know it. It's, it's funded by taxpaying dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's you've you've so captured the vulnerability and tenderness of a little body. 
And I think that I, I tried to achieve that with all that negative space and almost mm -hmm. making it diminutive so that it, the, the ferret doesn't fill up the whole composition. And you have the, the shadows that are uh, bluish, which kind of reflect this, mm -hmm. this fluorescent tube light, which is very harsh as, mm -hmm. as well. Um, which then, you know, complemented the, the rose petals and, and draws your eye into um, the, the ferret and even the, the little pig nose and ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the whole thing is very, very clinical except for his yes. body. Yeah. yeah. Shall I continue? Yes. The next one? Yeah. Okay. So I, I showed you most of the Vanitas paintings up until this point, uh, which were kind of bleak. And hopefully now uh, I can do some of the more uplifting paintings which represent Veritas, which uh, is this term that comes from this 12th century German abbess and nature mystic Hildegard of Bingen from, from Germany. And so this, this term Veritas can be translated from Latin to um, holy greening or, or greening power. It's it's sort of the, the source of all vitality and growth. And so um, that really informed my character uh, Sophia, who represents embodied wisdom, and she is the personification of God's wisdom. And so you see how her her colorful dress here and her her fiery orange ginger hair. Um, there's all these natural elements, and um, I also wanted to incorporate this uh, endangered hummingbird, the spatula tail which I thought was so, so beautiful and reflected uh, the same colors that, that she's wearing with the, the, the amethyst crystal around her neck and also just like the, the iridescent uh, green uh, shimmer of the uh, uh, feathers on the hummingbird. Yeah, it's, it's just incredible. Um, hummingbirds are some of my favorites, very favorites. I always think of Hummingbirds is kind of an antidote to the idea of unguided evolution because a hummingbird beak is yeah. made specifically to get what it needs out of the inside of a very deep throated flower. And how is it that those deep throated flowers just happen to show up at exactly the same time yeah. the hummingbird showed up? So, um, yeah, I, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah. So I was, I was going to say though about just art, art artist wise, um, there are two main sets of primaries, the red, blue, and yellow, and then the orange, green, and purple. And so this is an example of the alternate primary set. You have orange, green, and purple um, here. <clears throat> and I'm assuming that most of your colors were mixed out of orange, green, and purple. Yeah. It that, yeah, looks that's that way. Yeah, yeah, I can see that in the background neutral. Um, <clears throat> Yes, yes. Um, and, and I wanted to highlight earth tones, but tones that reminded me of spring and a new life. And uh, I, I thought the the daisy in her hair would also represent that and, and also like the, the motion and movement of, of the wind, which uh, uh, catches a few of the, the petals uh, that are uh, blowing to her left. Well, you can also see the um, the wind in her hair. It's just amazing. Yes. The, the, the feeling of atmosphere is just really striking. Thank you. Thank you. That um, well, I, I wanted to capture that movement. And, and like you said, with her hair, it's always very, very wild. And, um, you know, oftentimes uh, visual depictions of wisdom are solemn old women and there's definitely truth in that because you know those who are often wise are often older but in the, the book of proverbs where lady wisdom comes from um in chapter eight it talks about how wisdom is like the the artisan or little child at the creator's side um 
delighting in the creation of the world. And so I thought I, I would depict wisdom as a, a youth, someone who is very cheerful, someone who is, is, who is wise as, as well. You see this, um, uh, she's closing her eyes. There's this sense of, of inner wisdom that she's manifesting, but uh, nevertheless to uh, hopefully represent um, a more earthy depiction and a youthful depiction of wisdom was was really what I was uh, aiming for. Yeah, beautiful. Okay. So this is uh, the the Cairo stone painting, and she's uh, traversing through time with her companion, this Arabian horse, and. Uh, I was very interested in how these uh, Kalanish uh, stone circle standing stones were theorized to be used as as places of uh, counting the the seasons and and the days and how uh, embodied wisdom is very much about being in tune with the seasonal rhythms of creation and how in a modern world, with whether that be secularizing holidays or kind of this, this horizontal um, approach to time, which is very different than the medieval multi-dimensional approach to time, which there were sacred days, the ordinary uh, and profane that uh, philosopher Charles Taylor speaks a lot about. Um, this was something that was on my mind as someone very who's been shaped by the secular society that I've been in, uh, raised in, um, that, that this was a, a reminder to be in tune, um, not simply like with Kronos time, which is linear time, but um, Kairos, which is a, a decisive moment in, in time. And uh, that, that was something very much on my mind in this, this painting where you even see some of those megaliths floating, uh, which allude to these sacred moments in time. Oh, I just noticed. Yeah, some of them are. Yeah, there's one yeah, on the right. And and also like the, the shape of this painting is very, you know, biomorphic and organic, reflecting mm -hmm. the shape of the, the rocks and the land. Yeah, so if I remember correctly, Kairos also has this meaning of like, in due time or in the proper time yes yes in, in the fullness of time god entering into creation and, and bringing mm -hmm. about uh, a specific purpose this gathering of time um and yeah it's it's a very different concept than than what we think of of clock time so this very foreground stone rock um appears to me to be somewhat anthropomorphic, um, almost looks as though it could be um, Veriditas facing away from me, uh, okay. standing. Is that intentional or? It actually wasn't intentional. Can you um, see it? But, you know, I, I can see it a little bit like, like a, like a, the the silhouette of a woman is that yes, what yes, yeah 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 absolutely yeah. like like the the mm -hmm, the, think... the top uh, third or so would be well would be her the back of her head and her hair yeah. hanging down and then on the front on the the side of it you can just see her face that little um little bit sticking out there yeah we're we're backwards now so I mean as I'm looking at it it would be the right hand side of the stone but I think when we are aired is going to be the left hand side of the stone but yeah i'm looking at it i can see the profile of her face kind of highlighted by the rock behind and then her yeah. hair is streaming down her back and then the, the hollow of her back is that curve right below her hair yeah. and then the yeah. bottom part would be the you know she's wearing a, a rather large gown but um it, you know it's, it's big it's, sleeves hanging down right. and i yeah. can totally see it because that's the way i paint i make a big mess on the canvas and then i see oh wait a minute there's yeah. a woman there i'm going to capture that woman yes no that's that's right yes i I've, I've heard you say that in some of your other interviews um discovering shapes and discovering 
and, and our, our minds naturally do that. Like yeah. that's, that's yeah. very much our, how our human minds were. We're trying to find patterns and signs of life. And, and uh, that was totally unintentional. Um, but I've had several people ask me that, uh, which, you know, now that, you know, people have, have uh, mentioned it, it, it I, I do see it. Um, and I, I think that's, that's, uh, you know, unique, maybe it does add um, kind of a Well, it's a even better that it was unintentional. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. And that's what's, what's neat, because like, I think a painting is, is not truly finished until it's experienced in community with other people. Um, because you, you get these, these nuances and uh, additional layers of meaning added to a painting when it's seen in, in community, because mm -hmm. each person comes to to a painting with a different set of of eyes and, and mm -hmm. reference points yeah because yeah these stones could be like uh it, and there there is that that myth um that these standing stones were initially like giants who over time had had frozen and and turned into rocks um mm -hmm. and so that they they kind of reflect like like standing figures these standing giants so that's also kind of interesting to think about Mm -hmm. okay i think i had a, a close-up here just to show some of the the further detail yeah again the light is streaming out of that lamp because the edges of the lantern are that soft soft gray and that yes yes <laughs> and and that lantern picks up on the gothic revival style of the architecture in the first painting that you saw with Sophia in the background mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. where you see some of these gothic elements of the trefoil quatrefoil these uh, that that had symbolic weight of like the trefoil was presented of the trinity and so I I really thought that was an interesting kind of architectural motif um even going back to swallowed by knowledge with that lantern orb you see that that same um, gothic revivalist mm -hmm. style uh, that I thought uh, added so much, uh, you know, hopefully added depth um, and was something that I was just very uh, uh, visually something I thought that was unique. Did you have a model for her? Uh, yes. Yeah, so my my friend um, modeled for me and I, I took photos of her in uh, the backyard of my, my studio and um her dad and her mom helped with uh, so, some of the uh, like costume elements uh, and accessories like her her satchel and those bracers, those leather bracers, mm -hmm. um, because I wanted her to look kind of like medieval, um, maybe a little bit elvish, um, as, as someone that you couldn't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily think is modern, but, but it's coming from a previous era. Right. Yeah, and then I uh, used my mom's velvet green dress, <laughs> actually. Uh, she was gracious enough to let me <laughs> borrow that. Okay. Oh, wow. This is uh, Greening the White Cube, which is a little bit of my artist manifesto. It's uh, this the scene where, where Sophia peers into an abandoned art gallery museum and you see these i gotta say this is painted. absolute genius it's oh yeah absolute <laughs> genius <laughs> oh so, my goodness <laughs> it's it's a painting that um i you know knowing that i was showing in new york which is like the birthplace of modern art of uh, most of these paintings are in museums that that i've seen uh in in the city um they're all uh, from the 20th century, all painted by white male artists. Um, oftentimes, modern art was very opposed to organic life or to beauty or feminine forms. And so you see that uh, she's peering into the remains of the, the art market. Um, and, you know, some of the absurdity of it, I was, I was poking fun at. Um, like there's literally a painting uh, entitled Fool by, by Christopher Wool that sold for $14 million. And it's 
lying there on on the floor and so um i i think sophia she represents uh beauty and wisdom and also uh the the the, the female personification of of wisdom which i think has often been overlooked in the, the art world until fairly recently um and i think i have a, a close up here um and and even like nature itself has been something that the art world ha has been very adverse to. There's um, a, a designer, Ingrid Vettel Lee, in her book, uh, Joyful, which I, I highly recommend. She has a quote saying that modernism had a near allergic reaction to organic forms uh, in favor of a rationalist mode of design free of sentimental flourishes. And, and so uh, this is... Uh, my kind of subservient or subversive um, critique of, of modernism. With, so what, uh, what is Ingrid's you know. last name? Oh, Ingrid Fettel Lee, F-E-T-E-L-L-Lee, L-E-E. -E. Okay. Yes, she's... Uh, I, I will try to put all these references in the description. Could you back up just a little bit because yeah. I want to go over this. So I'm looking, okay. left, I'm looking left to right for, it might be flipped the other way for for the viewers, but from the left I see Picasso, and then yes. I see it's, it's Franz Klein, right? That's correct. And yeah. then you've got the urinal, as Duchamp's urinal on the floor yes. there. <laughs> <laughs> and then the the tank is that the same artist as the one who cut the the cow in half and put yes, it? Yes, yes, that's from yeah, da Damien Hirst. Damien um, Hirst, yeah. It, you know, it was funny because I was showing this painting to the fine art connoisseur editor, Peter Trippi, and he had been the, the curator of the Brooklyn Art Museum where they had um, brought this, this work in to, to display. And, and he was saying, you know, initially, and, and I agree with him, the, the, the title of this painting, The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living, it's, it's quite a mouthful. Um, but it, it is a, a painting that is a vanitas, um, motif in a way but what's happened is that uh it, it's been turned into this kind of fetishized trophy of art collectors wanting to uh you know signal their prestige and and it's weird because these these it, it is an animal for sure and and even jeff coons's balloon dog which is on the right hand <clears throat> side the orange balloon dog um represents animals but in a way uh, takes away their animality, their their wildness, and and turns them into just an object of wealth, a commodity, and I, I think that's that's very unfortunate. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it's there. There's a lot of irony. So on the wall, just to um, opposite the Franz Klein yes. on that wall. I've okay. I've lost the name of that artist. Yeah, that's the de Kooning. De Kooning. That's actually one of my very oh. favorite paintings. Even okay. though it's, even though it's so modern and in many ways it's so what a person might call ugly, when you actually get up and study it closely, you can see so much of I think I, I might be reading too much into it, but to me of what he was trying to accomplish in that painting is just quite a stunning work. It um, it is interesting and and that's there's a bit of a contradiction there because like de Kooning himself is quoted to say that that beauty is petulant to me uh, I revel in the grotesque and he he was very much trying to to deconstruct beauty but then in a way like I, I even myself see some beauty in it like even painting this this painting the the colors and the the texture of how the paint colors blend together there, there is something uh, yeah, I can see why why you would. Um, well, there's such a depth of, to me. There's such a depth of, um, and maybe it is the reveling and the grotesque, but there's such a depth of pain and passion in his use of line. Yeah. Um, that when you're looking at it up close, and I mean, I've not seen the original. I've only seen large prints of it, but um, sure. But it's it's quite a striking work. <clears throat> no, and and that's the thing, like. Um, uh, I'm not an artist who is just a classicist who is opposed to anything modern or contemporary. I, I recognize that a lot of modern art was created in a period of time uh, around World War One and World War II, where there was um, 
a lot of a lot of chaos there uh, a lot of the optimism of the 19th century had had waned and uh these these uh modern artists were were trying to uh seek for transcendence and meaning and reality and a lot of the sentimental art and that kind of sentimental view of beauty was being deconstructed i think uh, uh for for uh, valid reasons um and so in, in some ways, like I, I commend the modern art pursuit, whether that be like cubism, which was trying to deconstruct material reality to find meaning and rationalism and mathematics, like in Picasso's La Demoiselle de Vignon, um, or whether it be like uh, abstract expressionism, whether it be uh, like uh, Jackson Pollock or uh, de Kooning or, or others where it was a lot about emotion and self-expression and and that's where we find meaning through our, our feelings um i i think in contrast with a lot of postmodern art that quest for some kind of meta narrative or transcendence has been altogether abandoned for this kind of frothy bubble bath of of just return to aesthetics and formalism and irony and parody like you see in the the shark or the the orange balloon dog yeah and then the one of the other things i love about this painting is the deer just sort of stumbles into this world and is looking around like yeah what what is this supposed to be <laughs> yes I, I i wanted to um kind of give you the perspective like okay what would it an animal think if they had just sauntered into this this place like if you you happened upon and you knew nothing about modern art uh what what would be the the, the initial reaction yeah. um to these these remains yeah so yeah. it was uh you know hubris you you see uh you know as i was talking about in part one of our our conversation about nature's reclamation being a, a motif in a lot of my work I wanted to uh, highlight that element where you see like that the ivy growing in and the the ferns and the moss uh, and even like this uh, this this doe deer in in the foreground uh, and if you look really closely you can even notice that there's the the hummingbird um hovering oh, by yeah, by yeah. Sophia uh -huh. zoom in it anymore um and then no. you also have these mushrooms yeah go ahead I was I was just gonna say um if you zoom back out again you can see this non-identical repetition of the shape of the hole and yes. the shape of the canvas that's right yeah right? the yeah. canvas has this shape of a of an artistic palette and then the hole in the wall is sort of a organic version of that shape and so you see that non-identical repetition, and then you see it again in the highlight on the floor and somewhat again in the hole in the roof. So it's these non-identical repetition things that show up all the time, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously when an artist is working. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah. And like it, it, it was I, like, I was conscious, um, the shape in like the hole in the wall, but not necessarily of the roof, but now that you say that, I can see how it is kind of like the the inverse mm -hmm. uh, curve of the the hole in the wall. So yeah, uh, that that's um yeah, that's a really interesting observation uh, because I I think um like repetition and design, uh, we 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 understand it. We see it more subconsciously. Like as an artist yourself, you you know how to pick up. Uh, pick out those things but um we we feel like a sense of of rightness uh or or that it's very fitting to do that but we don't necessarily consciously uh think about those that repetition well i mean you the cool thing is you see it everywhere in the world um yeah just in the natural world in the way that god has yeah had his um stamp of design on everything that this exactly. non-identical repetition takes place everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that that's right. Yeah, common designs. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, mm. This is uh, in this birch grove. And in our first segment, I was speaking of my Russian heritage. 
And uh, this painting is probably one of the only times that I've really highlighted that in a composition. You see there's um, this, uh, Russian brown bear, um, which is Russia's national emblem. And then you have a Orthodox church that's a bit in the background. And you have also the Orthodox uh, tombstone markers in the background. And of course, the uh, silver birch trees, which um, have, have a you know sacred value and, and cultural meaning uh, for Russians. And they're still one of my favorite uh, uh, trees. Whenever I see uh, birch trees, they remind me of Russia and, and how they often grew around um, churches. So is there a symbolic meaning to the, the story of the of Sophia and the bear? Yes. So so while I was painting this this work, it was uh, around the time that the war broke out in Ukraine of Russia's invasion. And I knew that that would uh, mean my painting would be reinterpreted from what I initially had planned, which was just a reflection of my Russian heritage and how Sophia reaches out to this this wild bear and how she has a, a, a relationship with the, the natural world that is harmonious and peaceful, whereas Colette is disconnected from, from nature. But then when, when I was hearing about the news of, of the Russian Orthodox Church and the, the patriarchy being complicit in, in Vladimir, Putin's um, war in Ukraine and that of course I knew that he had formerly been part of the KGB even when we were in in Russia living there we knew um, of, of his shady uh, backstory um, but that also I was thinking about the, the way that we are approaching this conflict is just demonizing all of Russia and and Russians themselves, where there's uh, the corrupt government, and then there's the Russian people, many of whom are trying to push back against uh, the the uh, invasion, and and they're really um, not able to to protest freely there. And I was thinking about in, in Proverbs this this line of a, a soft answer turns away wrath the gentle answer turns away wrath uh, and how we uh, think about uh, pursuing peace and conflicts of war and and ways in which i think the west has been in some some ways fueling the conflicts between the the u.s and and russia and how this is seen as a, a proxy war and and it's, it's a large uh, conversation, but uh, it, this painting was, I, I suppose, uh, amusing on that, and and hopefully a, a gesture of peace from when w wisdom is heated. You see that she's reaching out to the bear, which represents Russia, um, in this this peaceful and embrace. So that was um, what was on my mind. Wow, well, still is that 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 was a lot in one uh, in one painting. Yeah. <clears throat> that's really very interesting yeah i think it's it's not it's not only the it's not only the u.s that i think is feeding some of it. it's it's the whole kind of media complex wherever it's yes. at. It's yeah yeah same always in, trying in to feed Canada. all of this yeah. strife right because that's where they, mm -hmm. they get eyes on their they get eyes and eyes is what brings money in the whole uh, internet age it, <clears throat> exactly and yeah yeah i think it th and this is the problem with just black and white thinking in, in general and and sadly like with with the media and and you're right it's it's western media in in general and in some ways it's it's worse here in canada i think how we've um addressed this this these issues in, in our media um where uh, you know a narrative is is pushed forward and there's only one solution proposed for solving this this conflict and any deviation people are are 
called uh i don't know conspiracy theorists or or just um you know silence or canceled um and and there needs to be more of a, a nuance and, and dialogue of of how to uh grapple this and as an artist i i don't uh, presume to know all the the inner workings and the complexities of of war and and what does the the u.s stand to lose if ukraine is taken over by russia and uh, also the you know ukraine has been known as as a money launderer and and definitely not innocent with with its history but uh, of course, I'm not saying it's justified what Russia is, has done, but um, th there are more layers of meaning that I think, as you say, the the, the media glosses over, unfortunately, and uh, it's it's very easy to pick sides, so to speak, with a lot of these these conflicts and and make them very simplistic when they're when they're not that way at all. Yeah, and a painting like this leaves. Uh leave some of that interpretation open yeah but that, that isn't to say that um that there isn't a valid interpretation of the painting but just to say that it leaves an open space for maybe a deeper contemplation of some of these complications well yes and even like the title of the painting is it comes from a Russian poem by by Nikolai Zablatsky called In This Birch Grove. And um, it's from the early 20th century. And what I really appreciate about the poem is that it's it's from a Russian grappling with like the, the sorrowful history of, you know, the Soviet Union and the, the previous czars and and how Russians have suffered, but also the the beauty that is represented in um, the the natural landscape of of Russia, of birch groves, for for instance, in the snow, and also the the beauty of of their culture and the beauty of the people. And so, um, I I see that that has been a a trend within a lot of great Russian art, and hopefully. Um, I can continue that legacy in a in a small way through my painting. So we probably should wrap up in a few minutes. Is there one final one that you'd like to yeah. share? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'll. Yeah. This was all creatures praise, which was the the compliment to all creatures lament. Um, and then the the final painting here is Alpha and Omega which is both characters coming together for, for one final piece. And uh, you see that uh, uh, Colette, he's come to the end of his journey. He has been guided. Uh, you can see there's the, the blue butterfly on his shoulder and the, the surroundings are of this, uh, you know, large um, Zen rock garden and he has been uh, attracted to this this you know non-dualist uh, perspective of seeing the emptiness of of life and vanity of of life but then sophia beckons him from within new creation and reminds him of all that is good true and beautiful and so you see this this meeting of of two worlds and she's carrying this sapling a cherry blossom tree and uh it's representative of the tree of life which is the the jewish symbol for for wisdom and the wisdom that can grow in a uh, colette's um, soul and so uh, you see there's this uh portal and um all these emblems of the 12 tribes of israel and then you have the cairo on top um uh, and this like crucifix emblem of the uh, Madagascan moon moth. And I, I really, through this series, I wanted to show that that wisdom uh, can can be complementary where you have Colette showing the vanity of, of life, but also uh, Sophia showing um, the wonder and beauty of of life and how both of these perspectives are are valid and uh, complementary. So, these are the symbols of the twelve tribes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So wow, these... because every one of them seems to represent Christ. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. So yeah, because you have um the line of the tribe of Judah there uh -huh. on the top right, and then you have the priest's breastplate on the on the left hand side, um, which uh, you know Christ is the the new priest. And yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. You know, these you have were the all... sheaves of wheed for the bread. Okay, you yeah, have the donkey that carried him into Jerusalem, and you have the the palm trees, the oasis of water, and then you've got the 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 tent from the the uh i'm assuming that's from like the the victory in battle mm -hmm. and then down yeah. on the other side is the the water the you know the water of life and then there's the scales yes. and he's the balance of the scales you know so that's, yes and is there was it intentional that the whole thing should look like the stargate oh okay no um no but that's interesting because, did yeah, you ever I, watch stargate I don't I I've heard of the name I don't think I know no I no, the star I the way the stargate works is it has these symbols around the outside like that okay and <laughs> okay. when um That's... and so whatever star that you want to go to you have to know the seven symbols that represent that star okay and, and they have to be in the right order so interesting um that's you know that and then yeah, as that, each star as each meaning. symbol locks into place you, you can hear it locking into place and then they bring up the next symbol and it locks. And then if the seventh symbol locks, then the stargate opens and you have this portal, okay. to another world. Okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating. I'm going to have to look that up uh, because that's like a very, that a very similar idea to this that, that I had in mind, which is like, you have these 12 tribes of Israel um, and you, you this this portal that that opens up but that without the capstone which the new testament refers to as as christ uh, or the, the cornerstone the stone that the the builders have rejected has become the the capstone is the the direct direct quote from the apostle peter and and it's coming in from above and really you can't have this portal to new creation without christ and so how it, it, it all fits together um that that's a very similar concept to the, the stargate notion that you just uh, mentioned well so so maybe to finish up here i just want to read a quote um that i saw this morning from yeah. esther lightcap meek um esther meek is a philosopher who has uh, developed this idea of covenantal epistemology okay that, that all of our knowing can only come about because there is one who is always beckoning to us and offering us this knowledge. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's a relationship of love that we have wow. that allows us to know, to truly know. And in, in this quote that she posted today, um, she's talking about a doorway. And, and that's what you have here is yes. a doorway, yes. right? A portal. Mm -hmm. And she says, it beckons us deeper into the heart of the real. It is pregnant with promise. A doorway suggests as well that we hold intention, the here and the near, where we are and the beyond. All of this is why doorway is such a rich motif as we consider thoughtful artistry. A doorway is a hospitable invitation to a farther world and to a more mm. deeply integrative shalom. It beckons mm. beyond, it beckons within. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to uh, get a copy of that later. Yeah, I will. I will. Um, I'll post it in the description section of the video. And uh, thank you so much for such a rich and fulfilling hour and a half here this has just been amazing josh i really appreciate oh, it thank you thank you for all of your great questions and, and insightful observations i just love um what you brought to this discussion um uh, and those those great comments on this painting especially uh really uh, uh illuminated a lot of the meaning thank you so do you have a, a theme for your next series so uh, I, I'm in the process of uh, coming up with I ideas and doing some concept sketches. Um, I, I haven't, uh, I have some ideas for, for titles, but at this point, um, I, I still want to take some time to, to think it through. I'm going to be 
uh, studying in Europe this summer, um, starting a, a master's of art history, and I'll be in Italy. And so um, taking in a lot of great art. So I, I have that on my pa uh, on my plate. And then in, in the media, I'm working on a, a new book. So uh, a, a book that will uh, include this whole Vanitas and Veritas painting series and uh, develop the, the, the concept of, of wisdom. And so uh, that's uh, what I'm working on right now. And it, it should come out either the end of this year or uh, likely next year. Well, when the book is ready, let's talk again. And, and uh, maybe you can talk more about the book then and we can see if we can get some people interested. So that'd be great. Yes, yeah, definitely. Thanks so much, Karen. Have a have a wonderful summer. It sounds like amazing time, and uh, and I, I can't imagine that you need any more education, but, <laughs> because what you're doing is already so extraordinary. But um, I know it's going to be a really rich time looking into art history and yes, I, thank you I for think sharing it, all your wisdom with us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, and I know uh, art history it can only help my artistic practice going forward and uh, my, my writing. And so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, what, what I discover. Yeah. And I, I, have you been to Italy? Before? I, I have been um, briefly actually on a, on a trip, um, world religions trip, uh, but I didn't do a lot of uh, looking at art museums. I went to Rome, but this time I'll be in central Italy. So I'll, be able to and we're doing field trips with the professor to like mm -hmm. Florence and and Assisi and uh, uh, Venice so I'm, I'm looking forward to to doing further um, exploration and also I'm gonna be in Paris France uh, bef before that which I've never been to and so I'm looking forward to seeing all the the art there well so two little things um, in Venice my yeah. very favorite museum in Venice is the Academia Okay. Um, there are a um, lot of wonderful museums in Venice. The, the Museum of Contemporary Art, which contemporary to them was like um, 19th and 20th century. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, actually oh, 19th well, century, too. mostly not not too much of the 20th century, but it's, it's remarkable. But the Academia has some absolutely remarkable pieces that I will never forget. One of them is the Bronze Serpent, mm -hmm, which yeah. is a, like... 40 foot long maybe painting of um the people mm -hmm. battling the serpents with the with yes. the bronze serpent yes. held on a oh, pole it's just oh, a remarkable okay. Wow. piece okay and the other Very one is uh, uh paulo veronese's um Veronese. feast yeah. in the house of levi okay absolutely oh, remarkable painting and oh, and then wow. in florence you know the one they always send you to what's the big museum in florence that's so famous Oh. It has the the um, Venus rising from the ocean. Um, oh, Botticelli's Venus? Yeah, the Botticelli. Yeah. So oh, that yeah. museum, okay. I didn't like all that much because it's so full of people, you can't get near anything. Oh, that's, but, yeah. yeah that's but the Pitti Palace, which is on the other side of the river, um, was the palace where they collected all the art for the the main guys there in Florence. And okay. that is just a gorgeous museum i mean so much beautiful art history in the pity palace oh so wonderful okay those would be uh, a couple of things i would mention thank you thanks for those suggestions yeah i'll have to look into those i'll be uh in italy for a month so i'll have time yeah. to do a fair bit of, of yeah if you can kind of get those. off the beaten path a little bit and get away from the tourists you can yeah see <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah wow sounds good Okay, have a great day. Great. Thank you okay. for sharing Take your time care. with us. Okay. okay, bye. bye, -bye.